From Viking invasions to Roman occupation, from countryside to coast, from historic wars between the English and the Scots to modern warfare, from a Scottish queen to a gypsy queen, from an artist from Manchester who regularly painted here to a local heroine who became a national icon, to boots discarded from weary walkers, from churches and abbeys to the ruins of priories and stunning scenery on the way. Join us over the next few weeks as we follow the route of the stunning Northumberland 250. We promised you Roman, so how's this? Welcome to the centre of Corbridge, Coria. Once a thriving town on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. From AD 50, uh, 85, the Roman army built a series of forts at Corbridge to protect the vital crossroads and bridge. Because this, there was um, a, two Roman roads, one from Carlisle came over here and one from Newcastle Way. So is that east, west? East, west, yeah. West, uh, south, north? Or yeah, sort of crossroads roughly, south. yeah. So, uh, after the last fort was abandoned in the middle of the 2nd century AD, a town prospered here for over 250 years. The town had fine buildings but also many humble houses and workshops. Craftspeople, traders and their families lived and worked here alongside soldiers and travellers passing along the important routeways of northern Britain. And we're only a couple of miles south of Hadrian's Wall. So. I said in a video a while back about going to St Albans when I was a child on a school trip. This is very similar to what I remember that being like. And this is the High Street. It's the centre of town life for about 300 years. So Keith just mentioned the two major roads. Got Deer Street, which crossed the River Tyne just south of the town, which was a major land route for those travelling north and south. And then in Corbridge, it met another road, later known as Stangate, Stainegate, heading west to Carlisle. The residents of Corbridge altered the intersection of these roads, rerouting the main north road through the heart of the town, creating a high street. And some of the town's most important buildings stood alongside it. Shopkeepers jostled for value, valuable access to passing travellers. So this high street was bustling with trade and industry. Originally constructed in the early 2nd century AD, it was remade many times until the final surface, the one on which we now stand, was laid two centuries later. And each major repair made the road higher until the doorways of buildings required steps to get down to them. Nice, you can see here. I love this kind of thing. Where the uh, bottom of these columns have been lower and lower as they've uh, remade the road and put gutters in. in level isn't there? There is. This is one thing about English heritage I always think that you can get hands on you can get walk right up to yeah it's, it's what more, you're, in. you're not kept away with barriers and things. More touchy-feely than National Trust. Yeah. Yeah. And you can wander. Yes. Not rushed. I don't suppose we ought to climb, but... <laughs> So 
So where, where Keith is now, there were two large granaries and an elaborately decorated fountain faced the high street, providing food and water for Corbridge's residents. Built by soldiers in the second century AD, they remained in use late into the fourth century. And there's a illustration of what they looked like. And the They contained grain and other foods or an integral part of any Roman settlement and inside paved floors were raised on stone supports allowing air to flow beneath to keep foodstuffs dry. The water flowed into the town along an aqueduct before pouring from a spout in an upper tank where impurities settled. They were very clever weren't they? They were. Further spouts released water into a large tank at street level from which people drew their water. Let's give you a 360. see the water channels, water courses, whatever you want to call them, whatever they were called. After a period of urban growth, two military compounds were built in the centre of Corbridge. In the mid-2nd century, detachments of legionnaires moved into the heart of the developing town. One was probably the 20th legion, Valeria Victrix, Valiant and Victorious. The other the 2nd legion, Augusta, which means majestic. The entrance to the compounds faced each other across a side street and were separated from the rest of the town by tall walls. Each compound had its own headquarters and accommodation. Those of the east compound were large houses, probably for junior officers, while those in the west were more modest barracks for soldiers. And we're here on the illustration. Now I've just learnt something new. Roman forts were usually playing card in shape. However, the compounds at Corbury were irregular, or are irregular. Their walls avoided the adjacent strip houses, which appear to have been built first, with the later compounds being fitted around them. So this suggests that the army didn't actually dominate the town. We told a lie. We told the dogs they weren't allowed in here, but we have seen people with dogs. We have. So we'll have to apologise to them later. <laughs> I don't know where you want me to go. Out of the light. Out I'm not in the light. Oh, is oh. it me? It's you. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Key. Well, you can see that any properly anyway. Ambition and opportunity. The construction of a huge courtyard building began at the centre of Corbridge towards the end of the second century AD. This imposing building may have been stated, sorry, started started by the army to store supplies for military campaigns, and could have become one of the largest in Roman Britain.
The extraordinary scale of its ambition and the quality of its workmanship suggests that huge, that huge investment was pouring into Corbridge at the time. The building was never finished. Perhaps the money ran out or a change of policy caused the work to be abandoned. Only parts of the East and West Ranges and the South Range, which are now facing us, were completed and later small shops and workshops were established inside. We're going to go into the building later where we'll see some examples of what has been found. This is an arm purse. This one's from Chester's Roman Fort. And they were commonly worn along the frontier. So today only the foundations of the storehouse remain. But these massive precisely crafted stones demonstrate the ambitious scale and cost of the building work. Its original purpose is uncertain, but suggestions range from a market or forum to the headquarters of a large military base. However, the most likely purpose, based on its layout, is it was actually intended to be a store. There's plenty of information boards around. It'd be nice to get the drone up, but we're not allowed. It would. What's this one? It's just the the start of the uh, military of, a, of an earlier Roman fort. It uh, housed supplies and the commanders. That's to the right. Yeah, commanders residence to the right and the officers to the left, or offices to the left. And a large hall for important ceremonies, ceremonies and a shrine for the sacred standards of the regiment. The ruins of the shrine can still be seen. Which are where? Presumably over there. Doesn't really say, does it? No. that's got heavier bricks work so yeah. perhaps that's the shrine rather than the buildings with the smaller bricks <clears throat> the fort was part of a network of military bases protecting the northern frontier of Roman Britain and supporting attempts to conquer lands to the north beneath the visible ruins of the town are the hidden remnants of the force that preceded it in 1964, archaeologists discovered the Corbridge Hoard, deep beneath the storehouse, close to where we're standing now. Probably buried by a soldier stationed here in the early 2nd century. Among the spare tools and personal items that were found were the best preserved cuirasses? Roman body armour of segmented armour ever found. Often wonder just how much is still hidden, even in places like this that have been well excavated. Mm. Not going to have found everything, are they? I wouldn't have thought so. fascinates me and amazes me and just to walk where the Romans have walked I know you can walk anywhere and people from historical times have walked there but the Romans are fascinating they were here for such a long time and still so much of what we do today, words we use today, came from Roman, the Roman period. But 
we're looking at English heritage. <clears throat> Look after places like this for us and future generations and past generations to come and discover, look at, learn from. There's no information on this. Well, this is interesting. Extensive site. As I said, it's fascinating knowing that there's still so much that can be discovered, not only in places like this, but you're thinking about London at the moment and the uh, work that's been going on for the HS2, how they've discovered and are still discovering historical London from medieval up to Roman periods you just don't know what's beneath your feet if you dig down far enough I was just saying it's fascinating isn't it that even in London now they're you know doing the HS2 and whatever they're still yeah. finding medieval stuff Roman stuff yeah. and yeah. They had quite a view, didn't they, from this village? They did. Town. Well, again, it's forts and yeah, land. You know, the land and you know, being able to see things, isn't it? Yeah. And the main street, Stane Gate, didn't just stop here. It continued towards what now town of Corbridge over there and that's where they think several uh, temples because of what they found from aerial sh um, shots and a uh, bit of archaeology digging they found um, they think remains of several temples that way the bathhouse was that way and so all sort of makes this area just part of the Roman town. No information on what this is, but this must have been something, wasn't it? Yeah. A well of some sort, I don't know. With the water was over there, wasn't it? Yeah. That'd make a nice garden trough, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not a Belfast sink, is it a Roman sink? <laughs> Still hold water. Yeah. We promised you Roman. Is this Roman enough for you? It looks like drainage ditches. That's up and down over hills. Over hills yeah. yeah. So that would say there's some force in the water, wouldn't it? Really? Yeah. And are these? plinths here with holes in so this must have been a structure There's something holding up well it was a structure wasn't it yeah. but wonder how many people it took to build it Mm. 
let's look another couple of information boards to have a look at we might find out from those and this I don't know yeah. you've got walls very close together then a little bit wasted space or is that been closed in or mm. so these drainage ditches are They're fascinating fascinating I love the drainage ditches Another board. So this was the headquarters of the second legion, the Augusta, which is the West Compound, was it? Was the West Com Compound, including yeah. Prince Sapir, turned over to industrial and residential use in the fourth century. This housed a small group of soldiers, some of whom lived in the two barracks behind us on the right. So that that area there, that look of it. Yeah. And we just walk round. The Prince of Pia consisted of a hall like the nave of a church for important ceremonies. Mm. Those, go on, go on. those large stones that we just said, that's the uh, water tank for this area. Ah right, Cause we, we thought they were a bit out of place didn't yeah. we? Beyond the hall was the sacred shrine where the standards of the unit and other sacred objects such as religious altars were kept. The steps beneath led to a vaulted strong room where the soldiers money was protected. Down here. And officers stood across to the right They had small feet. They had small feet. <laughs> yes, they did. This was a strong room? Yeah. No Roman coins lurking in the corner, is it? <laughs> if only. Very substantial, wasn't it? It was. In the strong room we've just been in, there was a relief found which shows Hercules raising his club to strike the mythical Hydra which is wrapped around his other arms. Perhaps he was meant to inspire the soldiers. Walking round and seeing all these people holding their phones to their ears. Walking thinking, like this. You come to a place like this and all you're doing is talking on your phone. The chap over there you see by the push chair. They're not phones at all, they're uh, audio guides. Silly us. This fence, saying more secrets of Corbridge lie beyond the fence to the south and the west. On leaving Corbridge, stripped buildings line the Stan Stain Gate as it ran westwards and Deer Street branched off to the south before crossing a bridge over the River Tyne. After about four days of walking, a traveller could reach York, Eberacum, the largest town in the north of Britain. And by the mid 4th century AD, the army had probably abandoned Corbridge, after which the residents of the town adapted the buildings to suit their needs. There's a silver tray was found in the riverbank. Corbridge lion, or a fitting ornament. So it all points to a very wealthy town. 
and sophisticated yeah. sound. Yeah, some painted plaster found in a house shows that the owner had expensive and sophisticated tastes. As we said before, what still lies on the ground to be discovered. And with the ever growing scientific implements, instruments that are being invented, made, you wonder how, how deep those will be able to go in the future mm. to, without having to dig. Or before they dig. That's Corbridge outside, but in the wizard centre, there's quite a lot to see. Heading into the visitor centre now. So much to see in here, we're not going to be able to guide you around it all. There's a shrine to Jupiter, Dolinkinus, Dolinkinus. It's a Syrian sky god. And then this one is Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ver Verus. A large panel dedicated to the emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus by the 20th Legion. In the governorship of Sexus Calpurnius Agricola. That sounds like agriculture. <laughs> It has been dated by consulship titles to AD 163. Wow. A glass stopper, a glass uh, flask with stopper. Fancy that surviving so yeah. long. You can't, you'll not really see through the glass, but it says the handles are formed as abstract dolphins. Oh, there's that tree. Oh, oh it's a replica. A replica of it. Yeah, the tray that we mentioned outside. The original wank serving tray is cast from 4.6 kilograms, 10 pounds of solid soil. Heavy then. Yeah. It was made around the middle of the 4th century, possibly in Ephesus, Turkey, which had strong links with the cults of Artemis, Apollo, and Leto, Leto all of whom were depicted on the tray. The Lanx was buried on the edge of Roman Corbridge in the late 4th century, along with other silver goods. I think the lion that we mentioned outside is this one here. I don't know if this is a replica or the actual one. The Corbridge lion. A ferocious male lion stands over its prey, a sheep or goat with a lolling tongue. Although the scale is wrong, the prey is as big as a cow. This is one of the most impressive pieces of sculpture from sculpture from Corbridge. And this is what was found in the strong room. So many finds. Dress fittings from the fourth century suggest that men of a high military are a men. Rank base at Corbridge, gold coinage and valuable finger rings demonstrate individual wealth in the later Roman period. Look at that ring there, number six. A large gold ring with Greek, Greek openwork inscription. That can't read because it's in Greek. The love token of Polemius. What's this? This is the Corbridge hoard. You mentioned it out there. I buried a chest full of armour and tools. Corbridge Ford had one of the most exciting discoveries made in Roman Britain. Segmented oh, armour, tools, knives. It says the chest was made from planks of older wood, dovetailed at the corners and strengthened by iron braces, which is number 13. 
Not. <laughs> Covered with a leather towel waterproof it and a lock plate ensured that the contents were kept secure and a lid was attached to the body with three boxing views. He packed a lot in he did. the box. <laughs> All right, so it says in the early second century, soldiers packed their belongings, preparing to leave the fort. Spare equipment and possessions are stowed in large wooden chests that are then buried for safekeeping until they return. The chest contained weapons and armor in need of repair. Bits of scrap metal and glass, spare tools and some personal items. These were perhaps the last contents of a workshop, a piece that did not warrant transportation to the next base. The owner never recovered his chest, instead the hoard with its neatly tied bundles and cloth wrapped cargo remained buried for nearly 2,000 years. I wonder where they went to for a fight and didn't come mm. back. We just said to Keith this is probably one of the best English heritage places we've visited. Mm. This is a replica of a painted two-stone of Flavinus, a 25-year-old standard bearer who served seven years in a cavalry unit called the Ala Petriana. And the motif of a cavalryman riding down a naked barbarian was often used on such tombstones, but the position of the barbarian is unusual here. With his back to the cavalryman, he appears to be fleeing, which was a cowardly act in Roman eyes. The original stone is now nearby at Hexham Abbey. Yeah, 12 sides for every story. These striking objects are some of the rarest and least understood to survive in the Roman world. The use is unknown, despite many theories and wild ideas by academics and writers. We have no idea what the Romans called these objects. They don't feature in contemporary writing or images. They're remarkably from all of the known archaeological archaeology across what was the Roman Empire territory around the Mediterranean, Europe, North Africa and Western Asia. Only 120 dodecahedra have been found. They were the work of expert craftsmen and casting each perfectly symmetrically 12-sided globes required experience and patience. All dodecahedra share the same basic structural characteristics with precise holes and rounded nodules. Welded at each junction, each dodecahedron varied in size and the level of delicate decoration etched into the bronze surface. No two are the same. And the individual qualities may suggest they were made to order. They would have been expensive goods with a very particular meaning. And some ideas that people have had out there. Use for knitting gloves, planning a harvest, light production, decoration, measuring gauges, surveying devices. Calendars, weapons, something ritualistic, just toys, or an astronomical measuring device, or even a candle holder. <laughs> no one knows, and I doubt anyone ever will. Actual dodecahedrons, one from South Shields Fort, one from Corbridge, and one from Newcastle Fort. There's a replica here as well, and it's quite heavy, isn't it? In here? It is. A bit of decadence. Keith's gone for a lemon cheesecake. And I've gone for a orange Jaffa cheesecake with coffee. We've arrived at in Otterburn or Otterburn Mill. With some stories to tell after we've had this.